and program on Other Than Internet 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The drowning pearl of the Indian Ocean. It's another week, and yes, the crisis continues. Sri Lanka's woes in sorting out its crisis stagnated as all hopes of IMF support seems to get further and further away. But is that a good thing? Slowly, Sri Lankans are trying their level best to cut unnecessary expenditure and save more while the economy continues to roll at a slower pace than expected. Would we, as a nation, be able to find a solution to this crisis by ourselves? Or are we still hoping for the Western gods to come to our delivery and keep us safe? Despite the well wishes, the status right now in this country is that the IMF bailout might get pushed to the second quarter. Inflation is still unbearable. Foreign direct investment, what, well, what foreign direct investments? Electricity charges are getting charged up once again and top it all up. The World Bank says that our economy will contract further in 2023. To make sense of it all, joining me tonight is State Minister of Finance Shahan Semhasinghe, former Energy Minister Uday Gamman Pillar, and former Human Rights Commissioner Dr. Pratibha Mahana Maheva. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Johnny, and this is the State of the Nation. Welcome everyone to the State of the Nation. Thank you very much for spending your evenings with us. There's a lot to discuss this evening as well, so let's get right to it. Well, in my opinion, one of the reasons we as Sri Lankans are in this state of horrid circumstances is purely because we as a nation forget our past. Last week I was watching the whole speakership drama unfolding in the United States Capitol. We saw after 164 years, a vote that was supposed to take only one round of voting, extending to 15 crucial rounds that culminated in the current Republican Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, succeeding. The vote was not what fascinated me. What fascinated me was, once he got the gavel into his hand in his inaugural speech, what he said. Listen in. You know, Abraham Lincoln gave his life in service to this country. One of his most important observations about America applies today, as much as it did 160 years ago. He said, we are striving to maintain the government and institutions of our fathers and to transmit them to our children and our children's children's forever. My fellow Americans, that is still our mission today. Well, if you listen to any speech made by any high-end U.S. politician, there's one thing they mention, the founding fathers. And in every speech those American leaders make, they ask that very same question. Are we, as the current leaders of America, acting on the premise of what our founding fathers intended their nation to be? It's a noble thought, isn't it? A nation that was founded on a single principle, freedom for all. And even after 200 years, the leaders of that nation is asking whether what they are doing right now is true to the foundation of the initial thinking. Now, this is the very same question we need to ask ourselves as well. This is the very same question our leaders need to ask themselves. Are we, as Sri Lankans, doing the very same thing as our founding fathers did? I'm sure you might not even know who our founding fathers are, because in living in modern Sri Lankan societies as such, 
We can't remember what we ate for breakfast, let alone our founding fathers, right? The Honorable Don Stephen Senanayake, or D.S. Senanayake, was one such founding father of our modern Sri Lanka as he led the nation to independence. Now let him explain what the premise of this nation's values he thought should be. Maturni, tamun nasal hitra ganto na, ape jatiye, nitahasanan lebilati enni. Ape tatwe, bohoma, ape asat vadiye adu enni. Ekat muka ame rata, tasrita rata. Ape inna ma manusyo, vasana vanta, guna vanta, virya vanta udaviya. और तो हार से गाना अपे उर में न तेला आती बुना तो मुकद्दू अपे उर में आए तले बिलाती है निशा ये उर में संपूर्ण प्रयोजन है गंटनम तमुन्नां से ला चिल्ल दिन आगे वीरिंग में तरंग प्रयोजन है कैतुनाई के लहितां पिता गानो नम तमुन्नां से ला मंग इल्लन ने तमुन्नां से ला कल्पना करन त्रपुज्जल अपे जाते नगंत सेलो वेटर और तम ये दिलाहितम क्रिया करो मुझे लाहितम बेगाबत तमुन्ना से मंग इल्लान टाइम में बड़ा बोर्ड तो इन्हें I hope it's really inspiring you. Now, the story is as such. Dear Sinanayake is basically telling what John F. Kennedy said. We should do our best for our country and not seek personal benefits from our action. Tonight, we as a nation need to do a soul search. Yes, we are at the bottom of the pit. And now we are finding ways and means of getting up. We have another individual who has lineage to the SNNIK himself as our current leader, President Rani Wickremesinghe. Is he doing what's right by our founding fathers and steering this nation towards prosperity that would be heavenly for all? Or are we doing more of the same? Week after week, I keep asking this same question. Are we doing more of the same? Because we keep forgetting it. If we need a yardstick to measure, let's measure it from the yardstick created by our founding fathers. The leaders of our current society needs to ask themselves, if our nation's founding fathers were alive today, would they be proud of the progress we made? Or would they bury themselves alive in shame? As citizens, we also need to ask ourselves, will our ancestors be proud of the life we lived or we are living in this country as its citizens? Or will they too burn themselves alive in shame? We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now if you think electricity tariffs are quite high and need to be brought to lower levels, well, you're not alone. Over 80% of the population of this country is considering the very same fact. The economists, especially the liberal ones, will tell you that if we are to get to better economic times, then we have to pay up. They are the very same kind who complain when they don't have foreign milk powder to buy and ask what happened to the dollars. Now, currently, there are two sides to this electricity price hike story. On one side, the Minister of Energy, Kanchan Vijayasekhar, says that if Sri Lanka is to continue pr to provide uninterrupted power in 2023, then we have to purchase oil and coal uninterruptedly. To do that, we need to find the money. Hence, the price hike. On paper, that sounds absolutely reasonable. जनवरी मासे देवनिदा कैबिनेट मंडले एट इधरी पात कराने में योजना कलती है ना क्रमवेद विश्व अतुले अकांडब लबना औरुद्द विदुली लबादी में वेनुएंग वियदम पामना सामान्य एक क्या रुपियल हातलिस अटाई साता हातलिस देकाक बाबटे पत्ते इकिला तमाय उपकल्पने कराने अभी में गासु सांसोधने नोकर में काटियो विदुली कप्पा दुआ टाइया तत्व विदुलिया लाभ दीम संधा क्रमवेदिक डन्ने नो 
But the Public Utilities Commission says not so fast, because according to their calculation, the Ceylon Electricity Board in 2022 alone made profits and the trajectory, according to the chairman of the PUCSL, is that in 2023 too, this path of high earnings will continue. We know from August till today, the raw materials like coal and furnace, oil and diesel, prices have gone down. So benefit of that should come. Again, the benefit of two hours power cuts should come. This is the lower demand that has taken place after the tariff hike and the power cuts. So benefit of this should go to people. And this is almost 12%. And we need to give the benefit of the less demand, power cuts, and the cost of the raw materials. We pay almost 200 rupees profit to CPC. And since it's a raw material and the, since the largest buyer of fuel is CB, they should give at Cost. When you give at cost, I think we can reduce when we use coal for power generation. So who's telling the truth and who's acting? Well, at this point, we have to look at both sides and make a judgment. What exactly is the government proposing in this new electricity price hike? For that, let's go to uh, Danidu Vitaramasam, who's at the data board. Uh, Danidu, good to see you. Uh, so, what exactly uh, does this new price hike uh, contains? I mean, what exactly uh, are we looking at? Is it a huge bump or is it a small amount which the people can actually uh, take on? Yes, Mahesh. Uh, unfortunately, at the data board today, we are not going to get to discuss a lot of positive stories, but something that the people really need to get an outline of. Now, what I will do today is to give a basic breakdown of just two specific areas when it comes to the tariffs that were that, that were released. Now, the minister had sent out a tweet which was you know shared virally about the extreme hikes in what the tariffs are. So we are going to take a look at what those are now. As you know, Mahesh, the breakdown of tariffs are amongst many areas, be it domestic, be it for general users, be it for religious institutions. So there's a vast area. But I wanted to focus on the major sectors. Now, domestic. In the domestic sector, we are looking at over a million customers in two very specific areas. And those are the two areas that I'm going to discuss with. And by areas, I mean the units that are being used by those specific individuals. Now, there are a lot, number of households that fall into this category. Here what we are witnessing is the unit prices that have gone up over the years. Past tariff mentions the tariffs that existed prior to August of 2022. Present tariff is what we are undergoing right now, it is after the 10th of August, that is in 2022. And here, the proposed tariffs, which are going to be constant amongst all the graphs that I'll be showing you today, is what we are going to propose as in what's going to happen in 2023. Obviously, we'll see the increase in unit price. As you know very well, Mahesh, this kind of consolidated composition, as in the, the, the amount that equates over time, is what becomes a huge value, or, uh, um, huge value as it goes along. Now, the 8 rupee margin was also considered to be extremely high in the past. But now, given that it's going to be 10, 30 rupees, given that that will be the uh, that will be the unit price between zero and 30, a vast improvement. Now, we we'll just take this thought process forward. Here we are looking at the monthly fixed charge, another value that will be generated from what we looked at before. If we just take one more step forward and look at, okay, if there are more than 181 kilowatt hours that are being used, what is the price change like? We see that there is a similarity in what we witnessed uh, in August of 2022 and what we are going to witness as a proposed amendment. But when we calculate that, and we look at what will be the marginal values, as in the minimum value that will be charged for, or the maximum value that will be charged within these specific sectors, we see that there's a drastic increase. So Mahesh, when we calculate all of this, when we put these numbers together, we see that over time, people are going to see a gradual increase in the amounts that they're going to pay for their electricity expenses. Over to you, Mahesh. As always, uh, a lot of information that is with one of us at the data board. Thank you very much. Now, however, there are factors which we need to understand. One such factor is obviously the IMF. Article 4 of the consultation report and later the staff level agreement reached on September 1st with the IMF. The IMF wants loss-making state entities to be sold to the private sector. This seems to be a condition set by the lending body, forcing us to reform our state-owned enterprises. It's good to make them profitable. But according to liberal clowns, selling these state entities is perfectly fine. But it will undoubtedly have implications in the future of this country, especially when a nation is not in control of its own energy, then the problem will arise. Remember the whole Yugadanavi fiasco? Now, in order to hurry the process of getting the bailout from the IMF sorted, the government is on a speed-up operation to clear these loss-making entities from its books and bring them to a position where it is attractive for any potential buyer. 
Hence, the double-down efforts in increasing prices and covering the losses. They're doing the same with the CPC. The question at hand is how did these state-run entities become such loss-making elephants? Whereas the, the industries they are in, if we analyze it, it should catapult them to high earnings and significant profits. Energy is, is a sector that, that brings a lot of profits. So who took the decisions to make them to be in this feeble state? Obviously, the blame will go to every administration that took control since the 80s and drove the economic policies horrendously. Now, you and I are called to pay the bill for the errors made by those leaders. Why? Well, sadly, it is also you and I who elected these uh, people to those positions and failed to hold them accountable for their erroneous actions. Like I said last week, the bill is now due. Joining me now for more is the State Minister of Finance, Shan Semisinger. Good to see you, uh, Minister, once again. Um, Minister, now the government is at a crucial juncture. On one side, the economy is getting worse by the minute. On the other hand, electricity prices are going to, go, um, going to rise once again. Taxes have kicked in. How come, this is the biggest question I have, Minister, how come a government that stood for the people back in the day is putting them in an unbearable position that does not understand their plight? Uh, Mahesh, it's a good uh, question you're raising. Actually, the, the economy is getting stabilized. We would not say that it's fully stabilized, but we are in the correct path of stabilizing the economy. We should also understand that, uh, that uh, Sri Lanka is trying to come out of its uh, worst economic crisis uh, since independence. We have never seen a crisis like this in Sri Lanka. COVID-19 was one of the reasons and then the global impacts also hit hard on Sri Lankan economy. So now uh, what we are trying to do is to retrieve the economy and to ensure that people could have a better life uh, than what they are having now. Of course, uh, we do understand uh, uh, the painful period people are going through. Recovery will be uh, painful. But the pain will be there for, for a shorter period. We, have, we are going through this painful period to look at a better time in the future. Yes, economically, uh, I mean, uh, there are a lot of reforms what we have been doing. The reforms uh, also uh, specifically target on uh, increasing revenues. It's not only the taxation uh, policy that we are looking at. We are also looking at our state-owned enterprises. We don't want any uh, taxpayers' money to be uh, incurred on sustaining any of the state-owned enterprises. So yes, uh, we do understand that people are going through a very difficult period, but the government is confident that we will uh, ensure a better future for Sri Lankans. Minister, where are we with regard to the IMF bailout? Are the negotiations being uh, stalled by the IMF because they want us to make certain changes uh, here, perhaps in our policies, laws, administrative methods, like the possibility of selling uh, CEB and other uh, SOEs? Uh, we are, uh, the negotiations are going on, uh, going on well. Uh, basically, we have uh, done the reforms based on the agreements we have uh, been having with the IMF. The IMF will put uh, the Sri Lankan financial system in order. Right now, uh, we are looking at a bailout package from uh, the IMF. The only, uh, we have completed all the agreed uh, prior actions. Uh, the point that uh, we are now in is the discussion stages with the creditors. We, are we have had three meetings with our bilateral creditors. And all three meetings have gone off well. Also, all the key uh, partners have taken part in these meetings. Uh, the Paris Club, uh, including Japan, and then India, China, all these uh, partners have taken part, and we are in discussion. We are very confident that we will get the financial assurances from our partners to ensure that we, uh, uh, we, we uh, become uh, debt uh, sustainable country. So the biggest threat right now is that we are unable to service our debts. 
So we want to make Sri Lanka a debt sustainable country and to ensure that we will not go into an economic crisis like uh, what we are in, uh, having now in Sri Lanka. On the other hand, uh, if you see, I see a lot of, uh, lot of uh, uh, news on IMF. I mean, certain news are positive news, certain news are negative news. But however, uh, I have seen uh, some people commenting on the IMF uh, process. Those, uh, those people have not even supported the government nor the officials to get uh, Sri Lanka out of this uh, basically crisis. So we are doing our best to ensure that uh, we are out of the crisis and the IMF uh, discussions are moving on well. We are confident that we will get the assurances to ensure that we get the uh, IMF executive board approval within the first quarter of 2023. Well, I mean, you see, it does uh, make sense to a certain extent. But uh, finally, uh, regarding the low-income families, which is the backbone of your party, what kind of uh, relief do you think you can give uh, them right now, Minister? There are lots of conversations about taxing them dry, but no conversation about increasing their income. What exactly is the government doing about that? These low-income families or vulnerable uh, communities are not being taxed. It's not a, a right comment. Secondly, uh, we are going through a transitionary period on the low income and vulnerable community registers. So far, we haven't had any digital register. So we are now in the process of obtaining applications. Actually, we have received 3.7 million applications from uh, families and individuals. The second step would be to assess them through the government uh, agents. The government agents and the uh, AGS will lead this process. We have briefed all the government agents how uh, uh, the need of this uh, digital registry to ensure that the most needy people are being supported by the state. So right now, uh, if you talk in general, people are unhappy because they feel the, sub, the, peop, the communities who are to be supported are left out of this pro, pro, program and who should not be in the program are being supported by the government. So once we complete this registry, annually it will get updated. So we, then the government will ensure that at a crisis like this, the most needy and the vulnerable communities will be assisted more than what they are getting right now. Understood. Uh, we have to leave it at that. Uh, Minister Shahan Simasinghe, State Minister of Finance. finance. Uh, thank you very much. So we have to uh, take a short commercial break. On the other side, I'll get the opposing point of view. We'll be right back. This is State of the Nation. to the state of the nation we're still discussing the current electricity price hikes it's uh, possibly coming into effect uh, this month if it gets the nod from the PUCSL people are asking uh, whether this is fair for them because this year alone soon after the economic crisis hit this nation taxes were um, increased prices of everything skyrocketed inflation was hammering us and the rupee crashed along with that the whole economy came tumbling now, down we have to fix this. And the people of this country have been asked by our leaders to pitch in. Not very much sure as to how much the leaders are pitching in, but definitely we have been asked to take the brunt of it all. Now with regard to the electricity price hike, it is done to make the CEB healthy and profitable and to ensure that power will be provided to the people uninterruptedly. Or is it a ploy to cover the losses and bring the CEB to a state where the government can sell it? 
Joining me now is the former Minister of Energy, Uday Gambampila, parliamentarian. Thank you very much for joining, joining me. Th uh, really good to see you once again. Now, uh, parliamentarian, the currently proposed price hike is, uh, I think, around 60% at the beginning of this year and uh, an additional 40% at the end of the year. Is this fair for the people? Not at all, Mahesh. That's why we are criticizing this because, as we know, government will have to incur additional cost to generate electricity during the wet, uh, uh, dry season of the wet zone, that is from January to mid-April. So, during this period, uh, water levels of reservoirs will go down. As a result, government will have to more depend on the thermal power generation for which we need to purchase petroleum products. But we have a viable alternative for this problem rather than uh, increases the uh, electricity tariff. As you we know, our peak demand for electricity comes from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., not during the daytime. It means our peak demand comes from not from the industry but from the households. We can introduce battery back rooftop uh, solar panels to meet this demand. In fact, solar panel importers have already imported in excess uh, to meet this demand, but people don't have money to purchase. So government can introduce an interest-free loan. Even if the government print currency and give a grant to the people, to especially middle class, the middle class houses, hotels and offices, start using solar panels, we can reduce the demand for electricity uh, from the grid as a result then we can manage without increasing the uh, tariffs so there is a viable alternative that's why we criticize the government for this tariff hike parliamentarian now if you remember the energy crisis uh, is the factor that led to the president that you all supported being chased away from office do you think this unbearable price hike which would cripple the economy of Sri Lankan households along with the SME sector would result in another unrest. Of course, yes. We should not forget that one side, uh, uh, prices of the everything has gone up. By, by last month, Sri Lanka had recorded fourth highest inflation rate in the entire world. So people can't afford food, medicine and other essentials at this moment. Uh, people have to face another round of price hike of electricity. Uh, then on the other hand, if you look at the SME sector, Sri Lanka's cost of production has gone up because of the disruptions in the last year. Our uh, buyers are moving to other alternative destinations. In this backdrop, if there is another 60% uh, price hike, of course our SMEs will not be able to uh, compete and they will have to shut down their factories, result in more and more unemployment. On the other hand, when big industries will move to other cheaper destinations where they can purchase energy at a cheaper uh, rate. So, towards the mid of this year, we will face a huge unemployment and unbearable cost of living, which may trigger another round of uh, riots. Well, um I do understand what you're trying to say. Parliamentarian, very quickly, you are part of a new alliance, which is the Freedom People's Alliance. When we look at the people who are in this alliance, they're mostly the people who were in power for quite some time. Now, what is the point of this alliance? And why should people be serious about what you have to say, let alone vote for you? Firstly, we have experience in coping with this kind of challenges. You know, some people have uh, innovative ideas uh, and they claim they have been, uh, they have never involved in the, uh, governance. This, we, are in un, we are in an unprecedented economic political crisis where experience is crucial. So we, we, we have the required experience. On the other hand, in respective governments in the past, whenever governments were about to make blunders, when they were anti-national, and they are going to have corrupt practices. We are the one who kept voice, raising our voices against it. That's why we had to um, sacrifice our ministerial portfolios. We were expelled from the government not for corruption, 
not for malpractices, but for voicing for the people and voicing against the corruption, blunders and malpractices. So our, we have a track record of being with the people, voicing for the people and we have always come out of it innovative ideas to solve the problems. Unfortunately, our previous leaders had no interest in solving people's problems. That's why we never had the opportunity of implementing what we believe in. That's why without going after so-called leaders, uh, uh, power families, power groups, we are going to stand our own along with the people for the betterment of the people and our uh, beloved motherland. All right, Parliamentarian, thank you very much. Uh, that was former Minister of Energy, Ule Gaman Pillar. We'll take a short commercial break. Back in a moment. everyone this is the state of the nation and now prior to the break i asked uh, from former energy minister about the upcoming local government election as well it seems like all is in place uh, to proceed with the election but there was a fundamental uh, bright spectrum that was filed and it will be taken up by the courts on the 18th of this month but there are still uncertainties uh, also as to who will foot the bill now the conversation is as such that the opposition wants the election and the government seems to be lethargic about holding it. And despite all that, many political parties have spruced themselves up and have uh, come together to push towards the election, hoping that each and every one of them will win. But I have a funny feeling that despite the politicians being upbeat about it, the people have already given up on them. And for this election, we might have the lowest voter turnout. Let's get more context to this subject. And for that, I'm now joined by Dr. Pratibha Mahanamaheva, who was uh, Sri Lanka's former Human Rights Commissioner. Welcome, sir, to the program. Good to see you. Doctor, now, some are asking for an election and others are saying uh, no focus on the economy. The government clearly doesn't want an election due to the unpopularity of the current administration. However, if the opposition wants to, um, the opposition right now wants to uh, ride this wave that they have, they think that everybody is believing in them and secure power so they can later force a parliamentary election. What's your opinion on this? What should we as a nation be focusing on? Mahesh, we have to see what's happening around Asia, what's happening in Sri Lanka. According to law, 1978 constitution, right to vote is a fundamental human right which has been accepted, guaranteed and protected by various Supreme Court judgments. On the other hand, right to feed oneself also very important to reduce the malnutrition. But it is not recognized as a fundamental economic right in Sri Lanka. So according to law, right of vote is the superposition and still economic right, right to feed oneself is developing and grooming up. But I can say one thing, when you see in Sri Lanka, you have to take into consideration all the factors. So election commission is the sole authority to decide, call nominations, dates and everything. So the government should support for the election commission by funding. The fund is very, very important. So the country at the moment we are facing another economic situation and we see even government salaries, one minister say one thing, another minister say another thing. So people are not trusting the government. So that is the basic issue. According to Kofi Annan, time to time you must have former UN Secretary General, you must have election and see it. The government is not losing with this election. The government can create mandate and they can give a promise, policies all can work together. So this is where 
the IMF also looking and the other international, international community also looking, let's go for election, see the mandate. So if they are actually short of money, there must be something people must sacrifice. If people don't vote, yes, you have to sacrifice something. So according to that, I think the decision is pending. Yeah, absolutely, doctor, makes sense. Uh, now, as the former Human Rights Commissioner, what are your thoughts on these NGOs who are once again drumming up noise, pushing for elections in the guise of standing up for the rights of the people? For me, doctor, honestly, all that I see is when these NGOs rise for anything, then we should run on the other direction. Because they have always proven that they have a nefarious agenda at hand. Is there a genuine push towards securing the rights of the people to vote? Because uh, if you ask me, the right to live in a better country where the economy is thriving is more important. What do you think, Doctor? Uh, Mahesh, I agree with you. But you can see with the Aragalia struggle what happened. All the NGOs funded, they were trying to overthrow the government. But they came up with the slogan, system change. Better. We need a system change. Exactly we need a system change. Youths must be given the priority. In, if you see in the parliament, out of 225, how many members are there below 35 or below 50? So this is the reality. But the NGOs now actually once again coming up with certain agendas. They just want to push uh, the president away and their ambitions were not met. So people actually now motivated by these NGOs. Now different type of NGOs are there. Election monitoring teams are there. Human rights organizations are there. International human rights organizations. All these now grooming up for one thing. What is that? This February 1st, you have to get ready for the United Nations Human Rights Council, Session 51-5. It has been passed and there are several conditions, several resolutions given, but Sri Lanka had not made. So now it's a playing field for the NGOs to come up with child abuse and uh, murder cases, all these things. And the NGOs are, certain NGOs are working for the election better if they are genuinely wholly hearted supporting for election that's all right but with that mandate we can't push the country into a very very bad situation like uh, Myanmar or like uh, if you see Venezuela so we have to see both sides so the NGOs must fully cooperate cooperate with the country not the government and see the real mandate where they go and how even after election 8000 uh, members are going to select out of this uh, president say only 4000 so when you see all this that another uh, era is coming up uh, even winning is not the situation survival in that are they playing a real role Absolutely, uh, it makes sense. Uh, finally, Doctor, uh, since I have you here, I want to get your opinion on a, uh, another subject quickly. Uh, it seems like Canada is embracing the LTTE propaganda and is becoming a safe haven for terrorists. It's clear indication that LTTE propaganda has worked wonders for them in Canada. Should these recent sanctions be something uh, for Sri Lanka to be concerned about? Mahesh. Even we have defeated LTT ruthless terrorist organization. Transnational LTT government is operating Canada, USA and other countries. So they have a revenge because of this terrorism. We put full stop. Canada is a country had given a lot of type of humanitarian assistance and uh, uh, humanitarian applications they are supporting. And the lobby work is better than Sri Lanka government. LTT diaspora supporting groups are there. Global Tamil Forum, like several groups are there and parliamentarians also there. So the first stage was to pass Bill 101. Sri Lanka had committed genocide. So May uh, 19, one week they are teaching all the classes how the brave LTT fought huh? and how the army had actually killed and violated international humanitarian law. Now they have gone for the second stage. What is the second stage? The responsible two uh, uh, persons in Sri Lanka, one former president and another also former president and two other uh, military officers have given the president pardon. Now, how come they decide they have done war crimes? You must have an international 
independent investigation even they should come to sri lanka and see it now arbitrary if they take this uh, uh, decisions it will be a bad example for the other countries also we are fighting against terrorism and we want that and you know uh, most of these terrorist groups are there around the world so what they have done they have seized the assets if any frozen the assets uh, movable or immovable and visa now visa is not granted for canada many of the military officers as far as everyone knowing now this is we are to show that internationally the unhrc sessions coming in february so they want to link up everything and they try to collect all these evidence and take to international criminal court this is one example where i can say that Absolutely. Uh, Prof, uh, doctor, I really sincerely hope that the Canadian people actually wake up and realize how much they've been duped by these terrorists. We have to leave it at that. Uh, Dr. Prithiba Mahanavaheva, thank you so much. Let's take a short commercial break. In a moment, I'll be back with more State of the Nation. Throughout the show, we have been very critical of the IMF's modus operandi. It has been discovered through multiple entities uh, during the time that the IMF has proven to be an organization that doesn't push a development agenda, irrespective, uh, respective to the people of a specific nation, but rather a very calculated operator aiming at creating subservient countries that fall into a spiral of indebtedness. We have detailed coverage on this, speaking to Greece's former finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis. Yet, amid all this, we now hear that the, I, uh, the miracle $2.9 billion bailout is delayed to the second quarter of 2023. This reminds me of the time that we looked out into the sea and saw our fuel shipments parked out there, not docking due to the lack of payments. But in this case, we're not getting the fuel, and even if we do, it's with a list of demands. However, thanks to the fake liberal economic doctors and fake newspaper readers who later became economic experts, the path we are on is as such, following an organization that doesn't know the basics of Sri Lankan society. This leads us to show eye-catching scores on our primary balances and ignore the bedrock of our community, the small and medium enterprises. In these challenging times, it gives all of our nation's citizens a sense of inspiration when observing the great efforts undertaken by the SMEs to keep their heads above the water. The adaptability and resilience in these difficult times are genuinely positive characteristics that can be understood about the entrepreneurial spirit in Sri Lanka. As we showed uh, you last week, the big businesses that can actually funnel the dollars required for Sri Lanka to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with regional and global leaders aren't doing their bit. It's not even being questioned by mainstream media. And no prospective Aragalaya in the midst to hold these big companies accountable. Well, not entirely true. There is an Aragalaya, a real one this time. An Aragalaya by the business owners with minor market shares who work not in the Colombo liberal clown circles but out across the country. Making sure there is food to be distributed to the plates of people that can't be keyboard heroes. Making sure that the luxuries we take for granted here in the safe haven of Colombo makes it to the citizens that needs them the most. Those are the SMEs. Looking after their own family's economy, they are potentially contributing the most to keep the ball rolling and this country going forward during these challenging times. The crushing electricity tariffs, commodity price hikes and taxation has been unforgiving to the general public, hampering the growth of a sustainable industrial base within Sri Lanka. But it is the prescription of the IMF, for some reason, regardless of the minds of our current law lawmakers, which have been made up to go uh, to the IMF and follow their calls, we, as citizens, need to look inwards and see if solutions lie right here. 
And also a reminder to all our viewers, if you need more State of the Nation, don't forget to listen to our podcast, which is released weekly. This week, the topic is about our economy and, of course, the IMF. I'm Mahish Johnny. From all of us at Other Dera 24, have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you back again next Sunday.